This time around, we're going to take a look at lines and planes in space, and then we're also going to look a little bit about three-dimensional surfaces. But most of the time, this video, I'm going to spend on lines and planes in space. So the question is, how do you come up with the equation for a plane or for a line or for a vector in three-dimensional space? If I start off with a drawing, I'm going to keep switching back and forth between the PowerPoint and this nice drawing whiteboard that I have over here. I'm going to start with some point P sub 0. And I'm going to call that point x0, y0, z0, right? So I've got x sub 0, y sub 0, z sub 0. That's my point in three-dimensional space called P sub 0. I'm also going to have a fixed point over, or a variable point over here, x, y, z. Now, if I start here at the origin, then really what I have between the origin and that p sub 0 is a vector. So let's call that vector r sub 0 that goes that much in the x direction, that much in the y direction, that much in the z direction. So that's a vector. I've also got a direction vector that tells me where my line goes. So if my line is going between p sub 0 and p, then that vector v will give me the direction vector. So think of that direction vector sort of as slope. You're talking about slope between two points being m. Here we've got a direction vector between two points. So how do I write the equation for that line in space? Well, I could set it up in vector form, right? x, y, z equals, I need my initial vector. So I need my x sub 0, y sub 0, z sub 0, plus some parameter times ABC, where ABC is that direction vector. That's my vector V. So that tells me in what direction I go. Now, I can split this up into three parts if I want. I can write it as x equals x sub 0 plus a times the parameter. I can write it as y equals y sub 0 plus b times that parameter. t is my parameter. And z equals z sub 0 plus c times that parameter. Another way of writing this is that vector r equals r sub 0 plus vt, where v is that direction vector and t is my parameter. And I can put different values in for t to get a different length of that vector that I'm looking for. But that r equals r sub 0 plus vt is a formula that you're going to see over and over. And actually, we're going to come back to it towards the end of the course when we start writing um, various integrals. All right, so this is the PowerPoint. This is what I had just said. Um, let's take a look at an example. So suppose I want to find the equation of a line through a point that's parallel to another vector. Now, that other vector has information on it about its direction. What do I know? Well, I know that that direction vector is going to be the values before the t. So here, the first value is 4. Over here, that second value is negative 1. And the third one is 0 because there is no t component in that third one. So that vector gives us our direction. Then we have our point, right? 1, negative 3, 4. So we're going to use that formula that says r equals r sub 0 plus vt. All right, the r sub 0 is our point, 1, negative 3, 4. And then the v is our direction vector. So 4, negative 1, 0 times t. Right, we could combine them together, right? So we could write r as a function of t equals. Now combine first with first. So 1 plus 4t. The second one will give me negative 3 minus t. The third one will just give me 4, right? There is no variable there. Or we could write it in three parts. x equals 1 plus 4t. We could write y equals negative 3 minus t, and z equals 4. So we can set specific values of t. Let's say we wanted this to go from t equals 0 to t equals 2. That will give us endpoints of a segment. Or we can pick values from like negative infinity to infinity or starting at t equals 0 to infinity, and that will start at that point and keep going from there. All right, those are the directions. When we set up these kind of planes, equations for 
planes, we need a direction. So you have a direction when you write the equation of a line, y equals mx plus b, m is your slope. You have a direction vector when you set up an equation for a vector or a line in three-dimensional space. How do you write the equation for a plane? Well, you need to know what the direction of the plane is. And that normal vector gives you the direction of the plane. Think of taking that blue vector and pulling it towards you or pushing it away from you. That will change the way the plane looks. You can also push it to the right and push it to the left. And again, that will change the direction of the plane. So that normal vector is what gives you the direction for your plane. You can check the slides that I put up there and the formulas in the textbook. This formula over here is the formula for the equation of a plane. The x sub 0, y sub 0, z sub 0 are these three points in point p sub 0. So there's your x sub 0, your y sub 0, your z sub 0. That's a point on the plane. This guy over here is the normal vector. The normal vector, remember, is perpendicular to the plane. So that gives me the direction. That is your a, b, and c. So really, it's a matter of fill in the blank. So I get negative 1 times x minus 1. I get 4 times y minus 2, and I get negative 3 times z minus a negative 3. So I'm pulling the x0, y0, z0 from the point. I'm pulling the a, b, and c from that normal vector. And now I just distribute. I get negative x plus 1 plus 4y minus 8 minus 3z minus 9 equals 0, and then I can combine things and clean them up. Negative x plus 4y minus 3z, and then what do I have? 1 minus 8 is negative 7. Negative 7 minus 9 is negative 16. Right. I can throw that 16 over to the other side if I want. Negative x plus 4y minus 3z equals 16. All right, how about this guy over here? Equation of a plane parallel to 2x plus y minus z equals 1 that passes through those specific points. So my a, b, and c will come from that normal vector that was given to me in this form, right? a, b, c. All right, so that normal vector is 2, 1, negative 1. All right, so using that same formula as before, I get 2, I'm going to write out x minus 0, plus 1 times y minus 2, minus 1 times z minus a negative 2, and that gives me 0. So let's clean this up. I got 2x plus y minus 2 minus z minus 2 equals 0. So 2x plus y minus z equals 4. I, I throw the 4 on the other side. I could leave it on the left-hand side as a minus 4, but I just decided to move it over. All right, and that was the whole method we used. All right, if two planes intersect, they intersect in a line. So look around your house. The floor and the wall intersect in a line. The wall and the ceiling intersect in a line. So you can actually find the equation for that line of intersection between two planes. All right, and so I'm going to put the problem up here, and then I think I'm going to switch over to a blank board so that I can write on it because there's not enough room here. So plane Q has that equation. Two, uh, x plus 2y minus z is 1. Plane R has the equation x plus y plus z is equal to 1. I want the equation for the line of intersection of those two planes. All right, and again, I just stole this from a PowerPoint. So let's switch over to this board over here. Here's the two equations, right? Plane Q has the equation x plus 2y minus z equals 1, and plane R is x plus y plus z is equal to 1. Well, the first question is, do they intersect? Because if they don't intersect, then the problem's over. It'd be weird if I put a problem up here that just ended like that, wouldn't it? But if they don't intersect, the problem's over. So if they're parallel, they won't intersect. So let's check. The first normal vector, coefficient of the x is 1, coefficient of the y is 2, coefficient of the z is negative 1. Okay. The second normal vector, coefficient of the x is 1, 
coefficient of the y is 1, coefficient of the z is 1. Okay. They're not scalar multiples of each other. In other words, it's not 1, 1, 1, and negative 3, negative 3, negative 3. If they were, then those vectors would be parallel to each other. The planes would be parallel to each other, right? Because if the perpendiculars are parallel to each other, then the planes are parallel to each other. All right, so then the next thing I need is I need to call the line of intersection L. And I want to find out where Q, will those two lines intersect on the xy plane. So to find the place where they intersect on the xy plane, on the xy plane is where z is equal to 0. So go back to Q, right, go back to Q, and set z equal to 0, I'll get x plus 2y equals 1. Right, and again, going back to R and setting z equal to 0, I'll get x plus y is equal to 1. Now solve that system. So maybe hit the bottom row with a negative 1, and that gets rid of the x's, and I end up with, oddly enough, y equals 0. When I go back and substitute, I get x equals 1. So the intersection point is x equals 1, y equals 0, and we already decided that z equals 0. What that means is that that's a point on the line of intersection. Great. Now what we need to do is we need to get the perpendicular of those two normal vectors. So I'm going to steal a picture here for a second. All right. Take a look at this picture over here. Suppose I've got one normal vector going up like that and another normal vector going across like that. If I take the cross product of those two normal vectors, do you see that I end up with a vector that's perpendicular to both of those normal vectors and is actually parallel to the line that I'm looking for, right? So I found a point on the line. Ignore the point this here. It came from a different problem. But if I take the cross product of those two normal vectors, perpendicular to a perpendicular is back to where I started from. So let's try that. Let's take the cross product of those two vectors. So remember, cross products, I've got my i, j, k, I've got my 1, 2, negative 1, and I've got my 1, 1, 1. All of these steps are outlined in the PowerPoint, it's just that I don't have the solution there, so that's why I wanted to run through it. All right, so let's take the cross product. 2 times 1 is 2, minus a negative 1 is plus 1, okay? Remember, it's always minus the second. 1 times 1 minus 1 times negative 1, so minus a negative 1 is a plus. And then for the k, I've got 1 minus 2. All right, so that cross product vector is going to be 3, negative 2, negative 1. And so now I'm almost done because that cross product vector is my direction vector, right? That's my V. So if I'm doing R equals R sub zero plus VT, that three negative two negative one is my direction vector and the R sub zero is my point. Remember, we're using this r sub 0 plus vt formula because I'm not looking for the equation of a plane. The last couple of examples I did were equations of planes. This is not the equation of a plane. This is the equation of a line. So we got to use the right formula, and that's the right formula. So I could write it in a couple of different ways, right? I could write r of t equals and then combine them. So 1 plus 3t, negative 2t, negative t. So I could write it like that. or I could write it in three parts. I could do an x equals y equals z equals and separate those three components. So 1 plus 3t, negative 2t, negative t. And I could write it like that. And that's the equation for the line where those two pieces intersect. And so if you come back here, like I said, the PowerPoint that's up there has all the in-between directions. I just wanted to show you. Um, the problem worked out.
All right, 136 I'm not going to do a lot with. 136 has all the really cool pictures. So if you had the like paper textbook and you were zipping through at the beginning of Calc 1 to see what could possibly be towards the end of the course and you came across all these cool looking pictures, this is a section with all the cool looking graphs. So I will let you work through them. The one thing I wanted to mention was what is a trace? A trace is what happens when you leave out one of the variables. So it's an intersection with a plane. So for example, when z is 0, you'll have the xy trace. When y is 0, you'll have the xz trace. And when x is 0, you'll have the yz trace. So in this example here, we already left z out of this. So if I have x squared plus y, 4y squared equals 16, then this thing here is just an ellipse. So when this three-dimensional graph crosses the xy plane, you're going to be able to trace out an ellipse, and that's why they call it a trace. Let's look at another type of surface. Okay, and some of these get a little funky. This is the, the formula I'm going to look at here for a second. z equals x squared over 16 plus y squared over 4. So let's look at the three different traces that are involved in this. The first one, I can't let z equal 0 because then the whole thing just disappears. So the xy trace, I'm going to use z equals z sub 0, where z sub 0 is some constant. And what am I left with? I'm left with x squared over 16 plus y squared over 4 equals some constant. And then if I want to divide through by that constant, then it looks very much like an ellipse. Okay, so you're going to have to think back to your knowledge of conic sections. Here's an example. There's an ellipse. All right, what if I wanted to find, instead of the xy trace, the yz trace? So for the yz trace, that's where we let x equals 0. So if x is equal to 0, I get z equals y squared over 4. That's a parabola. And if I look at the xz trace, the xz trace is what happens when y is equal to 0. I get z equals x squared over 16. That's also a parabola. So whatever thing this is, is two-part parabola, one part ellipse. So when I go to graph it, I'm going to end up with a three-dimensional surface based on two parabolas and an ellipse. Any idea what this looks like? Here's what it looks like. It's called an elliptic parabola, a paraboloid. So it's two parts parabola, one part ellipse. So you can see here when that graph crosses the xy plane is going to end up in the shape of an ellipse. The other two places where it crosses over you're going to both be able to shape parabolas out of it. And that's how it gets its name. It's an elliptic paraboloid. Primarily, it's a paraboloid because it's made of two parabolas, but it's also elliptic. And like I said, look through all the notes on 13.6. I laid them all out in the PowerPoint. And from there, you'll be able to see how these shapes go. How much of this are you going to have to draw by hand? Not a lot of it. You can sketch out an elliptic paraboloid. You can sketch out a couple of other basic ones. But when you get to those hyperboloids of one sheets and two sheets, I'm not going to expect that you can graph them by hand, but you should recognize them if one was put in front of you. All right, and that's the end of this section.